So there is a danger, I think, that the Assad regime may see the chemical weapons agreement as a license to continue doing what it does so long as it does not use chemicals. This means that clearly the United States and Russia in particular uh, have some very heavy diplomatic and political lifting to do uh, if Geneva is to produce the political transition that is at the heart of the June 30th, 2012 Geneva Agreement. For the United States and its partners, uh, clearly a central task is to stop the continued marginalization of Syrian nationalists in the opposition. The U.S. and its partners, in my view, have to help this opposition form a coherent, representative, and legitimate delegation to negotiate at Geneva, and, and this, this will be extraordinarily difficult. Russia, on the other hand, I think uh, has, a, has an equally difficult and perhaps more difficult task. Uh, it really has to persuade the Assad regime of two key things. First, the gratuitous shelling and bombing of residential areas must stop. There is no military aim, purpose, or mission entailed in any of this. This is something the Assad, uh, this is something the Syrian government could do unilaterally today. It could stop the shelling of residential areas. And by so doing, help to create a foundation whereby a meeting at Geneva could actually produce some creative and potentially productive discussions. Uh, if Geneva is convened with business as usual going on, I, I for one just can't see how those kinds of uh, positive discussions uh, could take place. The second thing I think that Moscow uh, really, needs to, really needs to press on the Assad regime is to convince it, and this is probably mission impossible, that the subject of Geneva is indeed political transition, and that the status of President Bashar al-Assad and, and, the, and the, the rest of the structure in Syria will be fair game for discussion and for results reached on the basis of mutual consent. Now, it's not 100% it's not clear to me that it's in the interests of Moscow to do either of those things, uh, but I, I suspect that's one of the things uh, we'll be discussing this morning. Thank you, Fred. Thanks for setting that scene. Um, I want to use that to turn to you, Lord Robertson, to begin our conversation. Uh, we've heard from Ambassador Hoff a fairly bleak picture. I think you said hurl uh, Syria hurtling toward catastrophic state failure. Um, so Lord Robertson, against this backdrop, I mean, you've, had, you've had to negotiate with difficult actors. You've had to use force to advance diplomacy. You've dealt with implementing agreements, uh, uh, difficult agreements issues of WMD. Let's start first with the prospects of, of following through and succeeding implementing the Chemical Weapons Agreement. Give us your sense of, of where, that, where the territory lays with that first. Syria is not far away from Central Europe. It's a two and a half hour plane ride. It's in the middle of an area which is already a powder keg. It's conflict, there's an internal civil war, but it's already spilling into Lebanon, into Turkey, into Jordan, into Iraq. And up to now, pretty well nothing has been happening. Uh, until there was a use of chemical weapons, and all of a sudden, we begin to realize that there's something grave going on here. And uh, what, what worries me, worried me uh, when we debated it in the, in the House of Parliament was that we seem to be ring-fencing the issue of chemical weapons, but saying, the rest of it simply goes on, and we'll simply wring our hands about it. So that's the, the sort of bad side of, of things, and, and, and I think that what it's done almost with one fell swoop is to destroy the concept of the responsibility to protect. Our, 
R2P, which was adopted by the General Assembly of the United Nations in 2005, and, and sort of gave an indication of what the international community should do if, if, a, if a state imploded and its consequences were spreading around the world. We seem to be saying, well, yeah, we did that. That's a good theory, but doesn't actually matter in practice. What I think now is happening, and what I think has got some good signs inside it, is the fact that Russia has accepted a degree of responsibility for what is happening. I think up to now, and I've argued with, uh, with Russians, uh, the Russian approach has been primarily negative. Um, I think that the Russian government felt that uh, in Libya they were duped. Um, they, they, they stood back and allowed a resolution for an air exclusion zone, and it turned into effectively regime change. And therefore, there's a hardened view that under no circumstances is President Assad going to be dealt with in the same way as Colonel Gaddafi was. But now, with the appearance of chemical weapons and with the predominance now of the jihadis on the opposition side, I think Russia now recognizes that it's got a very big and a nasty dog in this fight. Mm -hmm. And I think that is much to the good. We now have a resolution agreed by the Security Council. It doesn't go as far as to say what will happen if, it is, uh, if, if, if uh, uh, the regime does not comply. But in a way, it's like resolution uh, uh, 1144 on the eve of Kosovo. It leaves that hanging that the use of force might be there. And actually, we wouldn't have that resolution if there had not been the threat of force, if there had not been the possibility of America taking, uh, taking military, military action. But Russia is now engaged. And I think, as we found in NATO in my time there, when Russia is engaged, Russia is an effective, uh, partner uh, in trying to find the outcome and the solutions. It's a responsibility that they've taken on, and not all members of the Russian government will be entirely comfortable with it, but it's a new dynamic in the situation which I think can go beyond simply the chemical we weapons issue. We haven't actually solved much if all we've done is to ring fence chemical weapons, but say he can use every other method to scorch the earth and get rid of his opposition. Because 100,000 people have died up to now without the use of chemical weapons. And frankly, I don't think that there would probably have been any inclination by the regime to use chemical weapons again. But a standard has been established, which I think offers a degree of promise and I think there's now a responsibility on the United States and Russia in particular, but the Security Council in general to actually deliver more than just the dismantlement of a chemical weapons arsenal, which they denied having, um, but actually begins to look at the wider implications for the Middle East, which are terrifying, as we have just heard. I want to come back to a couple of issues you raised, including the parliamentary vote, but because you focus so much on Russia, let me bring Minister Ivanov in on this point. Uh, Lord Robertson just said that Russia now has a dog in this fight, has some sense of ownership or responsibility for the outcome, and that if the attention is simply on implementation of the chemical weapons agreement, uh, that, that doesn't actually solve very much. There needs to be a responsibility to go further. Uh, what, what's the dynamic from your perspective? How does, how does Moscow look at this situation? Um, do you feel a sense of responsibility the reality, viability of implementing the, the chemical weapons agreement and responsibility for, for taking this further on a political settlement. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. <clears throat> First of all, I want to say that I totally agree with the analysis of the ambassador of the situation on the ground. Maybe two points that um, we don't have evidence that uh, the Syrian government used uh, chemical weapons. Let us wait international judgment. And the second, that in Geneva uh, one protocol, there is no words about, uh, the, about Assad personally. There is a transitional body. But in general, I repeat, I agree with your analysis, and I think that this is the strange thing what we have in many of the cases. We agree in our analysis Russia, Western countries, but we disagree how to deal with the problem. And that's why, as you said, 
the, uh, the Syrian crisis is civil war, is regional conflict, but also it's international challenge. It challenge for all of us that we, great countries, cannot do something real to stop the violence because all of us were against violence. We're against that people every day dying there with chemical or without chemical. But we see what is happening there. We see what is happening in Iraq, in many other places. After the Cold War, we didn't resolve any serious local international conflict. What does it mean? That after Cold War, we, five permanent members who are responsible about the security, international security, we didn't take any serious measure, measures to create new mechanism which can help us to resolve such crisis. That's why this is not only the, the responsibility of Assad, of the government of Syria or regional organization, but it's our responsibility. This is the first point. And I think that we may speak about this. The, the <coughs> that the whole system of uh, governance doesn't work today. We have to recognize it. Why? Because after the Cold War, everybody started to do their deal. Americans started to create their unipolar world. Europeans enlarging European Union, thinking that they can do it easily. Russia, first of all, trying to survive, and then with uh, oil, gas, dollars, happy to, to, do their, uh, to do their life. And nobody seriously working on new mechanisms of uh, <coughs> conflict, uh, how to deal with conflicts. And conflicts are coming all the day. We see today Syria, to, tomorrow there may be other many. We have Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, or Mali. We have a lot of conflicts with, without serious po capacity to resolve that. That's why this is one of the lessons which we have to, to take from this conflict. Mm -hmm. Second, I think that <coughs> today, the main responsibility, <coughs> if we speak about chemical weapon, is of the Russia and the United States. Because only our two countries can really resolve that problem. We cannot say, this is the problem of United Nations, and some people say, or this is other countries. Only our two countries will have capacity to do this job, if we can. If we fail, it, we fail. We cannot blame, after that, Great Britain, or France or the United Nations. We will have to blame our two countries that we, and this is big responsibility, I think that of both countries. The second <coughs> issue, I think that very important. We, if you see uh, a lot of uh, analysis, you see that people say, there is no trust, hello, Jane. <laughs> that we don't have trust between Russia and the United States, between Russia and Western countries. There is no trust. Sometimes I feel I'm coming from the Cold War, that during the Cold War we had more trust than we have today, for different reasons. This is not the subject of discussion of today, uh, meeting. But this is true, because we cannot sit and take decisions together on many issues. And during the all major agreements in the disarmament uh, area were signed during the Cold War. And, uh, but how to create trust? St by statements, impossible. Trust you create only working together. That's why if we succeed to work together with positive results in Syria on chemical issue concretely, I think that it will be very big step forward in our bilateral relations to create this atmosphere of trust. Not because the United States will give want to give gifts to Russia or Russia to the United States because for different reasons or maybe to common reasons, we have the same interest to eliminate chemical weapons in, in, in Syria. If we can do positively this issue, I think that w also together we can lead the international process for political settlement. I repeat, our responsibility will be higher, not because I want to say that other countries, they cannot play a big role, but our Russia and the United States can, for different reasons, play the leading role to, to, to leave the international community to Geneva II and uh, etc. Now you ask me about Geneva II. I think that we have protocol of Geneva I signed by everybody. And you have everything there. 
not everything, everything, but some first steps to create the body from the representative of government or opposition. It will be with full power, transitional body. They will have to prepare political transitional period, changes constitution or something like that, and to prepare the country for the democratic elections in the future. It may, it will be, it may be one year or two, I don't know how many, but it will be under the uh, strong support and su uh, supervision of the international community. It means we have the first paper to start to work together and signed by everybody. And this is, I think, that very important challenge. So, Mr. Minister, let me just ask just a quick follow-up on that. Um, you talked about the con your concern about the system of governance and some of the, the greater uh, diplomatic issues surrounding this, the bilateral so aspect. Uh, you've said in the past that the Kremlin's priority is not necessarily Syria itself, but its relationship with America. In essence, that Syria is, is the diplomatic play, play, playing field for how Russia wants to be seen as being engaged in international decisions. From that perspective, clearly this is a victory for Moscow and that you're in the, at the center of the game. Um, but picking up on your last comments, is there a sense of responsibility, is there a strategy for the way forward in Syria beyond the chemical weapons agreement in Moscow? And is there a real, a real sense of ownership of responsibility for not just implementation of the current agreement, but for an enduring political solution? Uh, look, we cannot uh, write history from today. We know some history, what we know from past. We had experience in, in Balkans, good and bad and good experience. We were against the military operation of NATO, NATO in Yugoslavia, but when we, everybody, for different reasons, I repeat, understood after 78 or 75 years of bombing that it was unnecessary exercise, military exercise. We set it together and started to work on that resolution which stopped the war and started to create new political situation, new dynamic with our support, strong support, the same thing. If we voted in the Security Council in favor of that resolution, it means we take the same res responsibility as other 14 members of the Security Council for what is happening on the ground. That's why I think that we fully understand that elimination, control and elimination of chemical weapons, it's not the final story. It's only the, maybe the first, but in parallel, not waiting the elimination till 14 and after that start the political settlement. It's necessary to everything in parallel because without stopping military ex operations on the ground, you cannot successfully realize the elimination of the chemical weapons because it's necessary to take the control, it's necessary to eliminate some of them on the ground, some of the chemical weapons it will be necessary to take maybe out from outside from the, to see the, it's uh, very difficult. How do you will transport, for example, chemical weapons by the, on the ground if there is every day you don't know from there and who can provocate you with military operation. It means it's, you need to do it's everything. And that's why I think that the big responsibility of Russian and American diplomats today is not to be happy only with the resolution and with them, but to sit together and to prepare a whole roadmap, including not only chemical weapons, but also political situation, also how to prepare Geneva II, how to stop violence, how to open the door for humanitarian aid, how to help to uh, refugees, uh, millions of refugees outside. It means a lot of this is the whole picture. And if we have a, if success in this, in this uh, history, I think that it will be very good <coughs> signal, not only for bilateral relations, but also to work together in settlement of other many crisis, crises, starting with Afghanistan and going to the other regional problems. I think, you know, I think that's really good news because I don't think that's what the public perception of the Russian attitude at the moment is. But, you know, perhaps that's a perception that we've got wrong. Because we don't come here to speak to Atlantic Council. If we come frequently here to speak to the public opinion, we will understand better. Well, there's the, 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 the same to Atlantic Council. 
I know, and when you look at the distinguished audience of, <laughs> of us, you know, <laughs> people are hearing this for the first time, you know. And, uh, but it is, there is, there is absolutely no doubt, you know, that what, what, what you say is correct, you know, that if you know, Russia joins in these enterprises, you know, to deal with problems in the future, then, you know, it can only be for the good. It's a heavy responsibility, an uncomfortable responsibility. This is bad word, join. Why join? We have not to join. We have to do together. We don't join to anybody. <laughs> this, is the, this is the Cold War mentality, to join. This is, you have to join me. No, we have to sit together to plan what we are doing so and to implement together. Exactly. This is the partnership. Yeah. This well, is the partnership. Well, let me ask from that, because what we're about to see are the two, potentially the two presidents are going to sit together. We're hearing reports that if President Obama's uh, visit to Asia remains intact, there's a good opportunity for uh, uh, President Putin, President Obama meeting on the margins of the meetings in, in Indonesia. Um, so if they do sit together, given this agenda you just laid out, this is the time when folks are figuring out what's the next step. Let me come back to you, Ambassador Hoff. What needs to happen if there is a bilateral meeting of the minds uh, between our two presidents? I think the, uh, I think the, the specific challenge here, and uh, Your Excellency, I agree with you 100%, but the specific challenge is for the United States and Russia to agree in a highly detailed way what it is Geneva is actually saying. This has been the mission of UN Special Representative Lakhtar Brahimi since he took over from Kofi Annan to get the United States and Russia on the same page as to the meaning of Geneva. The words I think, the words I think are very clear, but I think if you ask Special Representative Brahimi even today, he would say, no, there is, there is not really 100% agreement on what, frankly, from an American perspective, looks very clear, a very plain, plainly stated requirement for complete political transition in Syria on the basis of, uh, of mutual agreement, mutual consent. Uh, this, this statement, I think, is the thing that uh, if the presidents can, uh, can nail that down, and if they can nail down the idea of what needs to be done inside Syria uh, to build a foundation for successful uh, <coughs> negotiations. Uh, Kofi Annan, when, when he had the job, uh, recognized very clearly that unless some substantial concrete things happen on the ground, the prospect for a successful negotiation is nil. He had five steps, basically, mm -hmm. a six-point plan, but uh, the first step was the negotiations themselves. Five steps that would need to be taken where the Syrian government, by virtue of the fact that it is the government, would actually have to take the initiative <coughs> on several things. Uh, President Assad agreed to do it, and nothing ever happened. So these are the challenges, I think. Get on the same page as to what it is Geneva is supposed to produce and get to work on uh, creating the conditions to make it all possible. So let me come back to you, Lord Robertson, because part of the, any of these meetings, of the, how do you go into this with, in a position of strength? What's the leverage you bring to these talks and conversations? Um, this hits directly at the fact you said we wouldn't even have a resolution if it hadn't been for the threat of the use of force. Um, but what, what's the dynamic now where we've seen in your country, the UK parliament, uh, balk at the idea of using force, uh, the prospect that if President Obama had gone forward with a vote <coughs> in the US Congress, that it also would have been uh, defeated. What, two questions about that. How does that impact the leverage, the negotiating dynamic, the, the dynamic that's in play now on the way forward, particularly as President Obama looks forward to sitting down with President Putin perhaps on this? Um, and then I want to come back and parse a little bit, so, since you're, uh, we all know you as an incredible politician in the United Kingdom, to help us understand a little bit more the dynamics inside the parliamentary vote on this. I think that might be beyond my uh, capabilities <laughs> <laughs> as a politician uh, to do with that. Uh, I think the dynamic in the present situation is that, that force was threatened. It's still there. It's still on the shelf. Uh, and it's still behind it. And I think you know, one of the reasons, uh, in my view, that Russia uh, has become 
engaged, well, let's say joining or, or whatever, but has become engaged, it's because that new factor was in play. And, uh, and I think it was not something that Russia uh, was in favor of, to put it mildly, um, and wanted to avoid. So it was an incentive. Um, as we've seen in, in, in the past, these things are required, if anything, is actually going to happen in the diplomatic game. I think it was Kofi Annan who once said, diplomacy uh, is, uh, is good enough, but diplomacy backed up by the threat of force is much more uh, effective. So that has to remain there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sure that President Obama is reluctant uh, to do it. Uh, General Dempsey, on behalf of the, of, the, of the military and the United States, has, uh, has uh, cautioned uh, about the consequences of doing it, but it's still there, uh, and it's still... It's quite potent, and it needs to be in the mind of, of President Assad and even of the opposition uh, to, to, what, to what is going on. Sure. So maybe without parsing all the politics of the vote, the, the parliamentary vote did, did spark some debate here. Is this a greater sign of a real questioning of the United Kingdom's sense of its own political will to have a certain amount of global ambition, coupled with concern about its actually capability to sustain the, the military cloud, to have that, that ambition. Would you read more? Is it right or wrong to read into this parliamentary vote what it signals about perhaps the role that the United States' uh, closest ally is willing to play in the coming years? Well, I hope not. Uh, I think that the United States Congress in many ways reflected a lot of the thinking. I don't think that they took the lead from what the British Parliament said because they were thinking it through themselves. There is an exhaustion at the moment with international involvement, never mind international military activity. Um, and I think people look at Syria um, without the expertise that some of us have and as Ambassador Hoff has, has illustrated, and it looks so complicated, so difficult. You know, what, what do you do about it? You know, what, what, where would the military action take place? What would it seek to achieve? And I think perhaps with that ill thought through, uh, parliamentarians reflecting a, a weariness by, by, by the electorate in a whole, so they said, not this time. You know, this is one step too far. But that's actually what happened in the Balkans in the 1990s. You know, nobody did anything after 1990 when the barriers went up in the Kraina. And it then became a horrifying sort of night after night, picture after picture, you know, um, horror story so close to our capitals until it got to the point where action had to be taken. And actually, that was action taken with Russia, Ukraine, and, and other countries at that time. And I think there will come a point where, you know, and this may well be the point, the chemical weapon point, where people start to rethink what their obligations and responsibilities are. You know, I agree with Igor that there is a lack of leadership, there's a vacuum at the present moment, there's a, an, insufficiently, an insufficiency of relevant institutions and unmodernized United Nations and the rest of it. Um, but, but actually, there is the responsibility to protect a concept that was dreamt up and endorsed by all of the nations in the United Nations, and we seem to have completely forgotten that that is there for imploding states with a consequence outside of their borders, we've actually got a policy, we've actually got a mechanism, and we seem to have ignored it completely. I want to come to our audience to bring in some questions from the audience. Let me ask you one last question, Mr. Minister, and then catch my eye. I'll turn to, to, the, to the audience. <laughs> um, from, from Moscow's perspective, how do you see, do you read implications into the way the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, Europe has responded to the Syria crisis, the congressional, uh, the, the lack of congressional action, the, the parliamentary vote. How does Russia see uh, the United States and its allies? Do you read something more into how they see their role in the world by what's playing out and what has played out <coughs> in the past weeks on Syria? Three points. <coughs> First point, and I, I, I want to be very clear, this is my opinion. Russia is not against the use of force and is not against sanctions. Because this is, we have UN Charter. This is, we have in UN Charter, possibility of use the force. What we think that it can, the use of force cannot resolve by itself the problem, political problem. It can be used if, as part of big settlement, as sanctions, 
We voted sanctions, for example, in the case of Iran, nuclear uh, program of Iran. It means when we see that it can help to go to political settlement, we, uh, many, in many cases, took such a decision. But when it is only to do something without understanding consequences, we cannot support it. I will, yesterday I spoke with Mr. Ekeus, and uh, because remembering the discussions uh, here in the United Nations before the war in Iraq. El Baradei and Belix asked some weeks or some months, I don't remember, to present the report about the elimination of chemical weapons, of nuclear weapons, of everything in, in Iraq. It was unnecessary to start military operation, and we see consequences, and we don't know what to do now in Iraq. This, uh, this is our position. That's why what we ask only, to have the dialogue, to sit together, to try to understand, and then, if we agree, as partners, go ahead. And in case of Syria or in case of other countries. In Syria, some people present very simply. Today, again, watching, I don't remember what newspaper reading. Uh, 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 something speaking that Assad is our guy of Russia. It's not true. It's not true for many reasons. I was one of the first ministers visiting Assad when he took position as president. For five years, I, uh, I tried to invite him to Russia with the visit, and I, 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 I failed. It means, I will not uh, tell you the whole story, but this is not true, saying, very simplifying the problem. This is your guy, this is my, my guy. This is our common responsibility, <coughs> and we have to work together. And I repeat, we, when we have agreements, Ah, and speaking about uh, uh, the, state and the, the Geneva uh, One Protocol, this is the <coughs> diplomatic language of compromises. Sometimes after that, each side tried to, to present. For example, in the resolution about Kosovo, there is no word about the independence of Kosovo as independent state. And some people after many years ago said, no, this, it means that this is independent. It not, it, it's not true because I was one of the authors of that resolution, and we discussed and never mentioned the independence of Kosovo. And now people are trying to explain me what we wanted to say. That's why uh, we have, we, if we have agreements, we have to have agreements and go ahead with that agreement. Mr. Minister, if I may, I want to bring in our audience. Uh, I'm going to ask, uh, I'll come right here to the two gentlemen here. If you can identify yourself for our broader TV and whole internet book, audience. Whole book, and best the whole book once said, ah, because Igor speaks bad English, that's why he didn't understand. <laughs> well, may, maybe, but this is paper. This is not what I am speaking. This is paper and voted by everybody. Mr. Minister, I must say, so 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 I, Igor, I, I speak bad English as well. <laughs> <laughs> but never, n nobody blame you. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, I think you've both made the case you speak one beautiful English. Uh, please identify yourself for our audience and uh, ask a brief question. If you want to direct it to someone specific on the panelist, I'm going to collect a couple of questions, and then we'll come back to, to you. I'm Daniel Serwer. I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins Sice. Fred Hoff uh, posited that an end to the bombardment of civilian areas was an important step at this point. Uh, Assad may not be Russia's man, but Russia is the main supplier of the weapons with which Assad is attacking civilian areas, and Russia could stop it if only by cutting off the supply of spare parts and, and, and other things. Would you be prepared to do that in order to lay a proper basis for, uh, for Geneva too? Thanks, Dan. Let me pick up the question right next to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Damon Edward Joseph, also with uh, Johns Hopkins Sice. Damon, you made a very good run at uh, Minister Ivanov on the question of Russia's position. And um, Mr. Minister, you stated that you agreed with Ambassador Hoff's very bleak assessment of the situation there. And even you now, you just stated that uh, Russia's not even opposed to use of force. And of course, you know, Secretary of State Kerry made a good faith effort back in the spring and continuing over the summer with UN assistance to work with Russia on the situation in Syria, and yet to no avail. So my question is, 
where is the difference? You say there's agreement on the assessment, and there's even agreement on use of force. So where is the problem? What about getting to the, the viewpoint that uh, the agreed concept that Ambassador Hoff is talking about? Thank you, David. Let me pick up a, a third question here in the front row with Harlan. <clears throat> Mike's over here. Thank you. I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. Uh, my question has to do with the consequences of success and failure. Uh, if Assad is using this chemical weapons as a ploy to gain time, it seems to me that a strike will be inevitable, and I think the Obama administration will be embarked on a regime change policy. But if this is real and Assad is determined to deal with his chemical weapons, it seems to me then Assad ain't going anywhere even though his term ends in 2014, how then do President Obama, David Cameron, and President Alon deal with having already set red lines and demand that Assad must go, live with the proposition that Assad must stay if we are going to continue to get rid of chemical weapons and possibly turn this into a much broader arrangement that leads to some kind of settlement in the region? Excellent question. Mr. Mm -hmm. Minister, why this don't we is, start this, is, this is for him the question, not, not three questions, all well, for me. You don't have to take <laughs> all three. <laughs> you can see the interest in Russian voices okay. in this debate okay. here. We'll start uh, with you, Mr. Uh, Minister. Uh, 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 first of all, uh, uh, to the, I will try to answer to the first question of the professor. Uh, Syria received weapons for many years. The Syrian government not started to receive weapons now to struggle to, to use it during the war. It received for decades to be prepared for the war with Israel. That's why they have a huge uh, quantity of weapons, and that's why what is now sending is very small portions which, which cannot change the military picture of the country. This is the first point. Second point. Uh, about the civilian uh, uh, region. No? Yeah. The, the, the problem is that when you have civil war, you cannot say, you cannot uh, see where is the front line very clear. Because sometimes so called people armed from the opposition, they use civilian, um, uh, civilians to protect them during the war. That's why you cannot say you cannot bomb here and then. The other, and the third point, uh, many times we proposed it's necessary to, to proclaim the fire stop by both sides at the same time. You cannot ask it only to the government because the other side, is clear, will use that moment to gain position. That's why we, we, you, you cannot ask Russia, please ask uh, Assad to stop. We have to ask all part, parts to stop uh, uh, the, the, the fire. And the fourth point, this is the, the general consideration. Unfortunately, today, the United States cannot give instructions to any country. Russia cannot do the same thing. If you think that we are in the previous period when you can, Mr. Gramika, my teacher, <laughs> can take, or Mr. Kissinger, take phone and say, stop fire, and immediately it, w it will be done. This is not the case. <clears throat> I personally went to, uh, I was uh, before the war with Milosevic, and I was in Iraq before the war with Hussein, asking them to do something to avoid military operation. And they didn't listen to me. And it was not Ivanov, it was my country behind me. That's why today the situation is more complicated and it's, it, we cannot simplify that you can call and to do this. Nobody listen to you. We have to, to think about more complicated. Uh, we can, I think that the main tool what we have as international community to do it together, to, to, to have the same position and to be strong then to, to, to demonstrate to this or that guy that they cannot avoid possible consequences of what, uh, what they are doing. Now the second question about uh, Assad and wh what it's necessary to do. The problem is what, dif what one big but very simple difference uh, before uh, last agreements. 
that uh, Americans, American, uh, uh, Americans' partners, they concentrated all their attention to one main question, to change Assad, without telling us how won't you do it, who will be the next guy who take power, what, uh, and only concern, we, we were saying, let us speak about, to see broader picture, let us see how to go to elections, or how to do the transition, and that's why in Geneva, I think that it was reasonable agreement between all of us, signed by the United States and by Russia, that it's necessary cr to create uh, a transitional board with full power, with the representatives of government and our position, etc., etc. You know everything. That's why when we reach such agreement, we, we, we signed the paper. And, uh, and uh, now I will tell you, I, am, uh, I think that we have to be very pragmatic in many things. In, uh, after when we stopped uh, military operation and reached and, and started to work on the political settlement in Yugoslavia, with whom we signed the agreement? With the same guy Milosevic. We stopped the war with Milosevic. And he was unacceptable for our Western partners. But my question was, it was necessary, I am ready to sign with anybody if I want to stop the war and to start the political settlement. At that moment was Milosevic, and after that Milosevic, you know where he finished his history. David, That's what parallel. If, if I may, just a couple of quick comments yep. on, the, on the questions. For, first of all, about the bombardment of, of uh, civilian areas and the nature of, of civil war in Syria. Uh, for us Americans, when we, when, we, when we think about civil war, uh, certain images immediately come to mind. Uh, General Grant uh, bearing down on Richmond and Petersburg and uh, General Lee desperately trying to stop him. Uh, a war of fire and maneuver between combat units. Precious little of that is taking place in Syria now. Yes, occasionally there's a city block that will be assaulted in uh, Aleppo or someplace, but there's very little going on in, in, in the way that, that most Americans would conceive of the civil war that took place in this country uh, from 1861 to 1865. What's happening to civilian residential areas is quite different. Helicopters deliberately hovering over hospitals and bakeries and dropping barrel bombs down on them. This, this, this sort of thing is entirely gratuitous. There is no pretense of military targeting in all of this. Yes, there are rebel elements in some of these neighborhoods, but there's, there is no attempt whatsoever to seek out military targets. Absolutely none. One thing, one thing Russia could do under these circumstances, I mean, it's easy to decry the problem. You know, what can be done about it? Very quietly, go to Assad, discuss the problem with him, and say, look, until we hear from Lakhdar Brahimi that you are cooperating with his initiative 100%, you get nothing from us whether it's under contract or not. You get no political defense in the United Nations. We're not going to make a press conference here. We're not going to share this with the Americans or anybody else. But here is how things work. When we hear from Brahimi that you're playing ball, then things can, then can return to normal. On the, on the chemical things, is, is, is Assad using this to gain time? Of course, but that doesn't rule out the possibility that uh, he could comply with the provisions. If I were advising him, I'd, I'd advise him to comply 100%. Take the air out of the ball, lengthen the clock. Uh, the difficulty here, the objective difficulty, and it's not just a matter of the United States saying Assad should step aside. The difficulty is if Bashar al-Assad becomes universally recognized as the party to a contract that now has to be implemented over a long period of time. This is 
the worst possible news <coughs> for Syria and for the neighborhood surrounding Syria because the humanitarian crisis will deepen, the impact on neighbors will deepen, Syria will implode economically and otherwise because whether, we, whether you like it or not, as long as this guy is on the scene, Syria is on a one-way trip to being uh, North Korea in the Levant. So Lord Robertson, how do you deal with that point there, building on Harlan's question about <clears throat> the consequences of either success or failure, the, inevitable, the potential of Assad's continuing role in this uh, in years to come, the parallel that the minister drew with Milosevic? Well, the deal was signed, uh, the Dayton Agreement was signed with Milosevic, and that stopped the war in Bosnia. But it encouraged Milosevic to do what he did in Kosovo. Uh, and he went on to do that. So you're pragmatic in one After case. After Kosovo, it was signed also with Milosevic. Well, yeah. But that was in the, in the, in the and, had he, and had he remained in power, goodness knows where he would have started, <laughs> where he would have moved to, to next, maybe Montenegro. But anyway, I think you, you can be pragmatic, but you also have got to be principled too. And you've got to face up to the reality that Ambassador Hall has actually... Uh, put forward here as well, you know, that, the, that the, the pragmatism has got to be, has got to involve looking forward. You know, what sort of process is it that we're going to get? I think we're going to hear a lot less of red lines in the future than we've heard up to now. Um, that's my guess. Um, <laughs> But I think we're now, we're now into the tangled world of diplomacy where Igor Ivanov is a great, uh, has been always a great, uh, a great practitioner. Um, and lines will be blurred. And, and I think sort of statements about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable are going to go into the maelstrom of that. And that's a good thing. You know, that's absolutely, it's absolutely right. And, and Russia is now very much part, very much engaged. You know, uh, Igor Ivanov and I were both together at uh, Practica de Mari Air Base in Italy for the, the setting up of the NATO, uh, the NATO Russia Council. And uh, at a press conference that was held afterwards, President Putin, myself, and, and uh, Prime Minister Berlusconi uh, did, uh, you know, uh, well, let's say Vladimir Putin and I tried desperately to get any attention away from uh, <laughs> Prime Minister. <laughs> Prime Minister Berlusconi at the time, <laughs> but, but, but I remember, I remember I mean, it was a very historic moment that, that, that President Putin said, you know, in answer to a question and, and showing frustration, he said, you know, this is a change in Russian policy, Russian foreign policy. He said, for 50 years, Russian foreign policy has been opposed to everything. We were against this. We were against that. Where has it got us? I answer, absolutely nowhere. And that was a sort of breaking point, and uh, <coughs> the ambassador of Russia to NATO is sitting in front of me here as well, and he remembers me going over the transcript of that day as well. It was true. Yeah, absolutely. And I think now we're into, a, we're into that new game, and I think that the pessimistic prognosis that Ambassador Hall has rightly painted for us might well be changing, because everybody is engaged in it. But I, but I was sort of saying, Igor, you, 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 you slipped away from this question about, about arming the the Assad regime. H has Russia actually supplied the S-300 no. air defense system? No. 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 Mm -hmm. Conventional weapon, yes. Mm -hmm. So gentlemen, let me bring in some more questions from the audience uh, in our uh, last 15 minutes. I'll start with uh, these two gentlemen in the back here. Please introduce yourself. Uh, brief question, please, and, and if you want to direct it to anyone. In particular. My name is Bassam Barabandi. I'm a Syrian living in DC. Mr. Hoff, I have a couple of questions that note. Basically, what I'm, I would like to represent here, the Syrian, how the Syrian look at United States, Russia, and the NATO in a way or other. I cannot say I represent anyone. Mr. Hoff, first of all, thank you for all the articles that support Syrian revolution. The point is that I think that most of the Syrian, they feel that, that um, the Security Council resolution on chemical weapons is as bad as Assad Act on Syria. Because they dealt, the Syrian, the American, and Russian, they dealt with very small, specific issue, the chemicals. And they forget the 100,000 people being killed. We believe, as a Syrian, that, <coughs> here's a question for Mr. Hall, that why the United States agree on such a resolution where it can ask more, demand more, like ceasefire? 
from the Russian part because the Russian, they save Assad on this resolution. I, and for Mr. Ivanov, um, since the revolution started, the Russians support Assad 100%. All the statements from Russia, they say that all parties should constrain themselves. You will make equal between the civilian demonstration on daily base and the machine killing of Assad on daily base from day one. Uh, it's true that Russia have a contract to send weapons to Syria since a long time. But in the last, let's say, two years, the Russian they used to send only spare parts, according to your own papers or documents, Russian papers. It's only spare parts for helicopters, M16 or whatever, M18, MI15, whatever it's called. So according to all the Russian reports, you were sending spare parts. You were helping Assad to kill. Unfortunately, the American administration, they are busy in its own domestic reason or domestic issue. They're, so they are not too much worried about and the Russian and sir, administration. Question, just question, one minute. Please. And the Russian, they are just busy to humiliate the American administration in Syria. So I don't know how this join together or work together can work in Syria. Uh, thank you. All right, the gentleman, please. Hello, I'm Nikolai Vidigar from uh, the Embassy of Denmark. Um, I would like to hear your assessment of uh, the influx of uh, foreign fighters and uh, extremist groups in Syria. Um, obviously, this is a, an area of shared interest, but uh, how to deal with it, thanks. Terrific, and I'm gonna pick up two more questions, uh, Jill and Matt here. One mic uh, to Jill and another one here. Thank you, Jill Doherty, CNN. I just wanted to uh, be very specific about something uh, that uh, Minister Ivanov talked about in terms of the Geneva One Agreement. You said that there's nothing specifically on Assad. So is that the sticking point that Fred Hoff is talking about? Is there something deeper? I mean, you could certainly eliminate the name Assad and come up with an agreement. What exactly do you think is a sticking point, which seems to be there, even though everyone says they agree on Geneva 1? Thank you. Thank you. And please, final question right here. Hi, uh, Matt Horn, uh, Global Strategies. Um, just two quick questions. Um, Lord Robertson, do you see a role uh, for NATO in, in this, uh, given the wider implications in the region? And uh, Minister Ivanov, you started your remarks saying that it wasn't even clear that the Syrian government itself used the chemical weapons. Um, I remind myself of the September 11th op-ed by President Putin, who said the same thing. And I think if you took out you know, Vladimir Putin's name in the op-ed, it could have been signed by Bashir al-Assad. I mean, so how do you square his op-ed with what's going on now after um, everything regarding, you know, where we are today. And, you know, I realize that we have to move forward, but I mean, how do you, you know, look at all these issues, uh, given the op-ed, given what's going on uh, in the region? And, and do you consider Russia, you know, enabling, you know, the bad behavior and the violations of international law? Thank, thank you. Thank you. So we've got four diverse sets of questions. In the last 10 minutes, I'm going to come back to you. Let's start with Ambassador Hoff, work our way down, and any sort of final comments you want to make as a, as a wrap-up here as well. Ambassador sure. Hoff. Thank you, Damon. I'll be very, very brief. Um, I, I agree entirely that, uh, that the Syrian opposition sees the chemical weapons uh, framework agreement and resolution as bad. Uh, that's, that's an objective fact. It's well, well published. I don't see it that way. Uh, in and of itself, it can be a very useful tool. Uh, an Assad regime that is, that is without chemical weapons is something that is uh, much less of a threat uh, to its own people and to the neighbors. Uh, the real question, though, is, is it going to stand alone? Okay, as, a, as a separate process while Syria continues to dissolve down the drain, while everything other than chemical weapons, including the kitchen sink, is thrown at uh, populated areas in an entirely gratuitous, non-military campaign of terror. That's that's the real question. If it stands on its own, and I've, I've written this, it's like, 
it's like having a successful operation removing an appendix uh, from a you know from a, a patient that's got that's got advanced uh, cancer. And I'll just the only the only other one I'll come on, comment on is the is the question of Geneva and what's the actual difference. Uh, the name Bashar al-Assad does not appear in the June 30th, 2012 <coughs> final communique of the Action Group on Syria. Uh, a diplomatic way was found to try to convey the idea that the objective of Geneva is full political transition to something that looks democratic, pluralistic, I think those are the words from the, from the Security Council mm -hmm. resolutions, but a full political transition. I don't know, I don't pretend to know where things stand right now <coughs> in <coughs> discussions between uh, John Kerry and his Russian counterpart on the meaning of Geneva. I know in the past there was a Russian position uh, to the effect that, uh, that somehow you know, President Assad and perhaps the security services should be exempted in some way from the, from the transition process and that perhaps the emphasis should be on a government of national unity, meaning a prime minister, a council of ministers, and so forth. So even though the name Assad has not been mentioned, uh, it's sort of the ghost in the room. And I think that the question of his status in the future has been the focus of some disagreement uh, between, uh, between the United States and Russia as to the meaning of the uh, provisions in the and agreement. Thank you, Fred. Minister Yanov. <clears throat> First of all, about your remark that uh, that resolution, Security Council resolution, saved Assad. Some people in this country say that it saved President Obama. Other people say that it saved President Putin or interests of Russia. We wanted, as Russia, not to save somebody or anybody. We wanted to find a solution for this problem. This is the first point. And please don't uh, speculate about this. Second point, for me it's clear, and if you are expert, you can understand, you cannot implement that resolution without political and many other measures of political settlement. You cannot do it physically. That's why if Russia and the United States really engaged to eliminate, to take under control in different places of the country, and then to start long and very difficult process of elimination, it means that in parallel, not waiting, but in parallel, you need to take many other measures, including political settlement. We, Without this, you cannot do it. That's why it's not true that somebody wanted only to limit their action with chemical weapons. It's not true. This is the first, but it was necessary to start, and this is, it, it was a good point, coinciding not only of Syria, because coinciding because we want to eliminate, we, we are doing in our countries eliminating chemical weapons, and we wanted to eliminate in, in the world, the chemical weapons, it's, we coincide totally, Russia and the United States. That's why this is only to start, and this is very important. The, the, uh, and uh, um, now about um, uh, the weapons to, uh, to, to Assad. The weapon, we, sa we signed a lot of contracts before, and we, as uh, Minister Lavrov said many times, we don't uh, violate any international agreements or any international uh, uh, um, rules uh, doing what we are doing. Because you have on the other side also um, countries without any justification uh, sending weapons to the armed group of the opposition. That's why it has to be something comprehensive if there is something comprehensive. It cannot be unilateral. Now about uh, G1, uh, say I agree totally with uh, um, Ambassador. The main thing is that we, you need to, we decided to open transitional period. And during that transitional period, to create somebody with representation of the government and of the opposition. That's why it's necessary. We don't know who will be from the, from the government, but it's clear it will be not President Assad. 
in that transitional board. And that transitional board will have full power in the country. That, this is very important. Yeah. For all the, we, I don't know, six months, one year, but that transitional board will have full power in the country till uh, elections or till uh, something. And this is, this is the main thing. This is not the problem on one person. This is, in general, the process which we can open if we do it. Now, um, about the role of NATO, this is for you, not for me. Okay, right I, I suggest not to use NATO, but this is <laughs> not, not <it's> my... <laughs> it was a helpful suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> and and the final po point, not answering uh -huh. to... I'm sure that I repeat, uh, and uh, I think that after that we have the other meeting with the Atlantic Council uh, delegation. I think that this is really, from my point of view, very difficult but very good chance to start real dialogue, Russian-American dialogue about international security. Mm -hmm. This is not because one wants to engage the other, but this is in our interest, not in the interest of Russia. It's in our interest to, to have dialogue to work on that issue, to give good example that we are working, and to create new atmosphere of trust, doing together what is in interest of national interests of two countries. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Minister. I agree, I agree very words. strongly with, uh, with that. And, and it comes back to the question the Danish uh, colleague at the back said. You know, there are elements alive in, uh, in Syria today who pose a threat to all of us. And if the jihadists and the Al-Qaeda elements get stronger and stronger, we've actually got nobody to blame but ourselves. You know, we're wringing our hands now, but this conflict has gone on for two and a half years. 200,000 people dead, huge displacements of populations, the overwhelming of Jordan and, and Lebanon. Uh, by, uh, by refugees. So, you know, we sort of say, oh, this is terrible now. The jihadis appear to be getting an upper hand. Um, so, you know, blaming in the past, I think, is useless. We need to look to the future. But there's common ground. These people have got to be marginalized and they've got to be eliminated. If you look back at the history of Bosnia, and I think people should really, you know, we, we, we do great lessons learned exercises after every conflict. We look at them and we put them on a shelf and we forget them. The Bosnian situation has got a lot of parallels with what is going on today. The jihadis were moving into Bosnia, exploiting the uh, persecution of the Muslim population in Bosnia by, by Milosevic. And it was only the peace agreement that stopped it and marginalized them and eventually got them kicked out. So the urgency about a situation where you get a process has not just got to do with stopping the killing, it's stopping the momentum that these guys have been able to achieve up to now. Should NATO, should NATO be involved? Well, actually, NATO is involved. Uh, Turkey, which has been affected by the Syrian conflict, has invoked Article 4 of the North Atlantic Treaty. Not many people know about Article 4, know about Article 5. And I must say, I didn't really know about Article 4 until I became the Secretary General. <laughs> But Article 4, by the wise people who laid down the, the charter at the beginning, allows a member nation uh, to come to the Council, to the North Atlantic Council, to say that they believe they are going to be threatened. It's a prelude to Article 5. It was invoked by Turkey before the invasion of Iraq because they believed that Saddam might do a diversionary attack on them. Uh, and it's been invoked now because the Turks believe that they are affected by, by what's happening in Syria. And air defense weapons have been put in to southern Turkey under Article 4 in order to give protection to that. So there is an involvement. And I know in the council, Turkey constantly reminds that there is a necessity for no-fly zones, for safe areas, et cetera, et cetera. Again, the parallel with Bosnia comes in. And we should learn from what happened the bad things and the good things that happened in Bosnia before we sort of assume that the wheel has got to be reinvented. But the thing about NATO is that NATO is not just made up of the 28 countries who are full members. It's also the partnership for peace that extends beyond the NATO boundaries. It's about the NATO-Russia Council, the NATO-Ukraine Commission. It's about the Mediterranean dialogue that brings in all of those countries who are affected by Syria at the moment. It's the ideal venue 
for actually having a discussion across a wider range. And I'm not sure whether it's being used properly at the moment to do that. And it would be a useful experience if it actually was to get onto the agenda of all of these different parts. Because in that way, you can start to look at the security situation, as Igor Ivanov says, in the round, rather than focusing on individual little bits and pieces that are going on. Thank you so much. We, we, I think this has just been a terrific conversation. We started on a fairly bleak assessment uh, this morning, and we're ending on a little bit of an of a optimistic note of the potential opportunity. Obviously, this is an incredibly complex situation. It's why we had this conversation today, part of our programming of our Hariri Center for the Middle East, our Scowcroft Center on International Security, is meant to help provide a sense of clarity on these difficult issues in terms of understanding the reality, the, the, the choices that decision uh, that leaders face, and really what's at stake. So I want to thank uh, our panelists uh, for just a terrific conversation. I want to take a, a word just to thank those, of, uh, those on our team that made this possible, Matt Hall, Stephanie Rowland, Laura Macedo, uh, as well as Samia Yacoub, and the team of interns from the Hariri Center. Thank you very much. But most of all, to Ambassador Hoff, uh, Minister Ivanov, and Lord Robertson, please join me in thanking them. Thank you.